This is Breaking Down Security, Episode 5, for February 1st, 2015. I'm Brian Brake. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Mr. Betcher and I are so happy to have our first interview of the year. You can say something now, Mr. Betcher. I just totally hosed up the intro, but it's cool. <laughs> awesome. Glad glad to be with everyone here. Yeah. 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 So um, I um, I want to introduce, introduce Lee Brotherston. Uh, I actually met him on Twitter, you know, the great melting pot of the internets. Um asking about a job slash networking opportunity with his organization at Leviathan security. You know, I told him one day, I was like, one day you're going to be on our podcast and you're going to talk about what you do. And he's like, okay, yeah, sure. And then we managed to wrangle him on. And, uh, I'd like to welcome you, uh, Lee to the podcast. It's- Thank you. Hi. Today, uh, this is one that we've actually wanted to do for quite a while on threat modeling. Um, because, uh, when we first started doing the podcast, it was something that I was told that I, you know, basically wasn't going to get a job uh, because I couldn't do threat modeling very well. I didn't understand what threat modeling was. So um, we wanted to do a podcast on it. And, you know, since Lee does that as his job, from what I understand, uh, first we wanted to we wanted to get a, find out where you started in information security, and then maybe go into a little bit about your job and how you do your threat modeling. Sure. Okay. So I'll start with where I got into security? Or? Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> okay. So uh, my first job out of university was working in an ISP. Mm-hmm. Uh, normal stuff, sort of uh, sysadmin slash a bit of engineering, that kind of thing. Uh, and this was the late 90s, so people with their own security departments were not quite as common as they are now. And then we recognized the need to uh, to do security. So as someone who'd been sort of looking at that in their spare time, I moved more and more into that space until I ended up heading up the security team there. From then onwards, it's been pretty much a progression of doing internal security for a bunch of different companies. And I've done it in different verticals. I've done finance, I've done hospitality, done entertainment, um, and until recently, uh, where I've gone to the same side, other side of the fence, I've uh, moved to consulting. So I'm on the other side of the fence. I'm no longer the internal security guy, but it's still the blue team side of the fence. I'm working with people on their internal security issues and their defensive posture and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So that's really, uh, yeah, really where I got into it. So what made you want to move to, to, to Canada? You're, you're obviously not Canadian. Uh, no. not American. So <laughs> no, my wife is Canadian. She lived in the UK for seven years. So we came over here. We're giving it a go over here. So we've been here three years so far. And it's been great. Very really nice. Enjoying it. Yeah. Okay. So your job at Leviathan is to go to companies and help them uh help their blue team people, like you said, you were you've crossed the fence to be uh, to do app, uh, threat modeling of networks and applications. Yeah, yeah. there's a, a mixture of things. It's sort of bespoke to what the customer needs, but yes, there'll be threat modeling uh, amongst other things, and sometimes we're brought in to do a one-time point check, so it might be coming in to, to threat model an application or an environment or to, or to assess it in some way, or alternatively, it might be a long-term engagement, because sometimes people don't have security teams at all, so we, we can sort of comprise that role for them too, but yes. On that, um, have you found that firms hire consultants like yourself because they have a, a time-sensitive issue to resolve, you know, like a breach or failed or failing compliance, something like that? It, that's one of the reasons. It's sort of three or four main reasons. One is, like you said, it, it's it's a time-based thing. Um, we do do instant response from time to time when it comes up. And obviously, that's the sort of thing where they want someone now who doesn't have to come up to speed, who can just walk in and do it. And not many people carry instant response in-house in any large number. So they often ship that out. Um, another one is just the lack of expertise. They may have uh, largely outsourced IT or maybe just a small IT department, so they don't warrant a full headcount on security. 
so they can they outsource it to people to to do that sort of thing um or the third area is sometimes the independence angle because an internal person saying something and an external person who's been paid to come into something, it, it carries a slightly different weight with senior management sometimes um, in much the same way as an auditor can tell you what your staff have been saying. And, you know, sometimes having an external person come in, it can demonstrate that the results they've found are not skewed by some sort of bias that the person has because you don't have that bias. You, you've not got personal relationships in the company to maintain. You've not got you know, some promotion that you could shoot yourself in the foot for or something like that. You've been brought in to assess something and you can do the cold hearted assessment. You know, similarly, you didn't write it yourself, so you don't go soft on it either. It's uh, you can come in, uh, give the independent angle. And, and a lot of people, I think, appreciate that, too. Cool. So when you're doing your threat modeling, uh, one of the, you know, during our our research and everything, we found several different types of uh, methods for uh, application threat modeling. One was the OWASP method, which they call STRIDE, which they the threat types are spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, or escalation privilege. Uh, there's another one called DREAD, which is, is very similar. Um, do you follow any kind of specific guidelines or frameworks when you're doing application or network threat modeling? We don't align ourselves and say we do uh, threat modeling as per XYZ standard and say that that's what we do. Um, a lot of the, um, the different standards and frameworks have a lot of similarities between them. So uh, you will probably find that most of our tests do align with one or the other in some fashion. However, what we try to do is make sure that we're um, aligning with the customer's own culture. Um, and in doing so, that often means modifying the language to make sure that it fits the language of the organization. Um, uh, and similarly, you, you're also adjusting it to their product and their business type and just their general style of working. So some companies like to have a, a long in-depth analysis with lots of quantitative analysis, uh, lots of comparison to other organizations and all that sort of thing, which leads you to have a big, bulky, uh, um, you know, analysis document at the end. Other people, um, they really, really just want a light touch and they want um, a quick summary and they want to know what are the really bad ones I have to deal with today and what can I push lower down the pile and deal with later. Mm -hmm. So because of reasons like that, we don't have a fixed methodology that you would use in terms of uh, the language used um, and the way it's played back. And, and also, in some ways, I guess, the order that you do things, um, because being an external consultant, you don't always have access to all the information in exactly the sequence you want it in. So if you are coming in to assess someone and you're given a day, a week, two weeks, whatever, you, you, know, you, you hope to have all the documentation up front and you hope that all the people you want to interview and speak to are available, but it's not always the case. Sometimes you've got the documentation, you've interviewed someone and, and then someone else isn't available and they have to be pushed till a couple of days later. So it doesn't quite come in the sequence that you would uh, see it if you were following a flow through, but that's part of dealing with engagements really. But, um, but at the end of the day, the real process is still the same. You're still trying to discover the same problems and uh, articulate them in a way that's meaningful to the customer. And I think that whichever framework you look at, that's the end goal, mm -hmm. no, matter, no matter quite what order you go through and what language you use to express that. Yeah. So do you ever, do you ever get on site and they, they'd say, well, we just want a, a threat model? Or do they, do they have specific uh, requirements like, well, you know, we're a retailer, you know, Target just happened, for instance. Yeah. You know, we're we're wanting to make sure that that doesn't happen or, uh, you know, we have a lot of people from different, you know, uh, nationalities on different continents. Insider threat is a thing for us. So can you do a threat model based on insider threat or is it just a general thing all, all across the board? Um, it, it's mixed. It, it is all over the place in all different sizes. I would say probably the two largest uh, we have a compliance issue, mm -hmm. not, not an issue, but, you know, um, 
we work in with financial data and we've heard of this PCI thing, or we work in healthcare and we've heard of HIPAA, yeah. can you come and just look at our environment as a whole? Can we just can we just see where we stand on this stuff? Or it's right down the other end. We're launching an iPhone app. Can you come and look at the iPhone app? Oh, that's you know, cool. And, and you're down to specific application, literally like a binary kind of level of looking at an application. Um, and and obviously there are things in between, but um, I personally see more of those two types than anything else coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you mentioned quantitative analysis. Yeah. A lot of people in our industry frown on that. Is 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 that too subjective, or or is that something that's almost a requirement from the client? Um, it depends on well, it depends on the client to a degree. But what what we find is that um, there are different ways of when you're analyzing things, particularly when you're dealing with risk and doing risk analysis. Um, there are a couple of ways, and there's the traditional high, medium, low matrix where you rate uh you know um impact against chance of something happening and you rate it low medium high or really low low medium high and critical or whatever wording <laughs> you want to use but it's normally a three by three or a five by five matrix of some kind yeah. um and that is far too open to interpretation because very often those are not clearly defined they're just it's high ish yeah. then what does high actually mean and even when they try to make it quantitative it's not because they do things like there is more than a 70 percent chance of this happening but how do you arrive at more than 70 that it is more than 70 percent chance happening yeah. it's still kind of a gut gut feel so it's not really uh using any solid um mathematical derivation to get there or the other end is where you do do the quantitative analysis but it's deep it's using a long process that involves lots of comparisons, lots of math, lots of data, and it's it takes a long time to get to, neither of which really suit us. We don't really have the time, nor the customer probably doesn't really have the interest in us deep diving a risk assessment on any one particular item just to get that high, medium, low rating at the end of the day. Yeah. Similarly, you don't want to have the... Um, uh, the the gut shot because that one can be argued too much it's very emotive people say why is my application rated critical i'm sure it's not that bad and um you know and and sometimes you have someone in the room who is not looking to hear the message and giving them uh something else to talk about gives them the opportunity to railroad the meeting and sidetrack the conversation about fixing things because they can argue about the risk analysis and argue should it be high should it be medium when really either way it's getting fixed we've just got to debate how it's getting fixed and when it's getting fixed so um we can rate things like that but we tend to also use a thing called binary risk analysis uh which is um, a very quick and light method of assessing risks um, in which you get 10 questions, I think it is, and they're all yes, no answers. It's, is the item protected, yes or no? Is it, um, would there be consequences if attacked from outside the network? Yes, no. Uh, does it cost a lot to repair? Yes, no. And um, it generates the high, medium, low rankings on everything. So you then get around the fact of having to have this argument. It's uh, unemotive and it's sort of cold and calculated and really it doesn't get sidetracked. It really just gives you a method of prioritizing. So by doing that, we can produce risks and uh, ratings to the customer that literally are just used for prioritization work. And we don't have to sit debating it in meetings. We can talk about the real work of um, fixing this, moving on, what the remediation path looks like and all that sort of thing. Now, now for your remediation path that you, you mentioned there, do you do like a, is it a phased thing or is it like a 30, 60, 90 day or hey, in a week, this is what you can do to make yourself better immediately? Because we did the SANS top 20 controls last week. And one of the right. things was, um, you know, the quick five. And it was like, you know, check the access permissions on people, you know, get your patching within 48 hours and whatnot. Do you have certain things like that where you'll say, okay, 
in two weeks, you should be able to do this. And you you know, your, your risk register will go down a lot because of that. Um, a lot of it's down to context. So, um, for example, if you are assessing an entire company for some regulatory thing, I don't know, P PCI or HIPAA or something, if you find something in that environment, because, for example, in PCI, not everything is the cardholder environment. There are other environments. So if their focus is PCI, I would imagine that the cardholder environment stuff is probably going to rank higher than a lot of the rest of it. And often it's the criticality of the of, of whatever's been found too. You find something that say you know an unauthenticated remote um, root privilege exploit or something. That's a go fix this now. Don't yeah. stop for coffee. Just go and fix the mm -hmm. thing. Um, if it's an information disclosure thing, you know someone may be able to spend a week firing packets at a host to work out its uptime. Then that's really like way lower down the list they often kind of sort themselves in that sense um the only way well, not the only way but i think the main way that i end up bumping things up the list is when they're grouped because you often see the same error repeated over and over and over again but with different consequences or different ratings because of the context of where it is so to take an example um in a web application you may find that uh there's cross-site scripting error that's a common enough problem and it may occur in some serious and less serious areas of a site but you may suggest to the customer that they clear it up at once because it may be the case that you're fixing one function that parses user input and that fixes a whole bunch of risks some high some medium some lows so sometimes the lows jump up purely because you're doing one fix, you might as well hit them all in one fix, or you might accidentally hit them all in one fix because you're fixing it in one place. Um, but typically, that is the point of ranking stuff, to give the, the priority level. Although you do you kind of have to work with the customer to a degree because they know their business, so they know what's important to them. So they know, I can say, this is the vulnerability I think is the scariest. This is like, this is the one you need to look at and they're like no but to our business this thing over here this is the important thing and and obviously to them they have their own sort of um uh, view on what's important and at the end of the day it's their business so we we try to support them in that and and uh, and rank things accordingly we can do the best we can do is you know we understand their business beforehand and we offer the best advice we possibly can with the knowledge of the business that we have and the technical knowledge that we have. Um, but sometimes that needs to be tuned to fit with someone's uh, business. And, you know, that's, that's fair enough. That's their business. Cool. So when you're assessing an application, do you do the traditional um, data flow diagram? Um, or do you, like what I'm trying to get at is theory versus practice. Do you, right. you know, uh, how, how do you approach that now with, with the experience that you have? Right. So with things like data flow diagrams, we try to have that information ready from the customer before we before we arrive somewhere. Um, it depends a lot on the type of business, their level of maturity in their IT organization and a bunch of other things. But some have all the documentation ready and that would include data flow diagrams. And that's amazing when that happens and some of them don't some of them have next to nothing they it's all locked away in some guy's head and uh, you, you you hope he's there to dump the information on you um we really try to uh to, to give an idea of what documentation may be helpful in that sense because a customer doesn't want to be um hiring a consultant in for their security expertise and then spend the first three hours sat there in visio trying to to draw something up for them that they should have had all along it's not the best use of their of the time that they're paying for so really if they can produce that stuff then we can spend more time focusing on actually doing assessments and and looking at what's uh, what's happening in their environment that said it's not always the case they don't always have it and obviously you know we we find our way we 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 work it out but it's uh it's not our core competency it's not what we've been brought in for so we try to avoid spending time on on that sort of thing you could say the same for any con type of consultant right you know true yeah get your crap together before i come in because otherwise we'll be wasting your time right exactly and 
on no, a similar vein. You're wasting our time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same with having things ready, not just from a documentation perspective. Like, if we're coming in to, um, to assess an application, can you have a copy of the application there and installed on something for us to look at? If it's a source code review, is the source code available? Um, you know... <laughs> Do you it have a developer so... to sit next to you and, and drive the application to, to show you functionality? and Exactly, yeah. You know. And then other resources available to talk to. And, and if it's an environment um, that we're looking at, if it's a theory, like a paper-based test, then do you have the documents? If it's a plugging a, 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 you know, a piece of equipment in and doing vulnerability scans or doing a penetration test or something, um, do we have the relevant authorizations to plug in? Do you have an IP address for us to use, et cetera, et cetera? It's, um, it's all that sort of thing. that You can easily kill half a day in sort of, I guess, administrative work, for want of a better word, when you could be, could be dealing with things on site that are much more in the scope of what you're meant to be doing. So... I think having customers or clients um, sort of understand that it's in their benefit to have that sort of thing ready and to be uh, and to be prepped, they get much better results because obviously we're then spending the time doing doing the core stuff that we were brought in to do. We're doing assessments of one one sort or another, whatever that may be. Well, if they don't have that stuff available to you, then you know you can also say, well, you don't have a data flow diagram. That should probably be something you're looking at doing after this. Yes. You know. Yes. I mean, Doug, that is a finding that you get from a lot of different types of assessment is lack of documentation. Yeah. And even even no matter what your view is on the uh, regulatory compliance stuff, PCI is a prime example. A lot of people are not massive fans of it. But one of the things it does say is have documents for X, Y, and Z. And <laughs> it's not a bad plan, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, you know, <laughs> if it'll get you documentation, that's that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so so the binary, the binary risk analysis, how did that you, you said a friend of yours created that? How did that come about for him? Did he just think that up out of the blue or I or? think so. I mean, he's a smart guy, so uh it, it wasn't an accident. It's you know, deliberate and purposeful. Um, although I, I, I didn't know him at the time he did it, so I can't speak firsthand to that. But, uh, but um, I think the main idea was to take this emotiveness out because uh, both of us have used it as the uh, internal security guy mm -hmm. role before. And um, we have both been in that meeting where... Um, you're you, the one I described earlier. You're in there. You've got, you've got something um, that you want to get changed, the vulnerability, say, and it's been risk assessed. And you're there. You've got the, the the lead engineer. You've got the change control person. You're all lined up to do it. And someone comes in and goes, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! That that's my app. We're not we're <laughs> not changing my app. <laughs> it's not going anywhere." <laughs> and and um, and then they yeah they sidetrack it by talking about the analysis. And with the 10 questions, it's really, really easy because you can't argue with it. It's, um, it's very difficult to argue with, you know, there are consequences to an internal resource doing this. It's, yeah. like, it's, it's not a long debate to have. Even if they do want to argue it, it's not a long debate. And then you've yeah. got your ranking and you can move on and discuss the useful stuff. Well, the, the binary thing kind of runs counter to what you hear when you ask a PCI or a QSA a question, you know, oh, does, does blah, 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 is it covered by PCI? Well, that would be, they always say it depends. Right, yeah. So this system right. is black or white, which for me, right. I'm, all, I'm all in on. So yeah, um, yeah. I know that when I was um, trying to figure out my new job, what systems needed to have a more higher priority for with regard to patching and vulnerabilities and, you know, trying to figure this exact same thing that you're, you're, you're talking about out. I was like, man, I can't do a qualitative risk analysis because I don't know enough about the systems. You know, this would be easy for a quick questionnaire. It'd be like sitting somebody down for five minutes and asking them these 10 questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so, yeah, so it's a, it I, I think it works well, and uh, yeah, I would I would recommend people try it. If nothing else, you know, next time you're doing a risk assessment or something like that, just try doing it alongside your existing methodology because it's quick, and then you'll see if it's useful to you or not. 
Oh, I'm I'm definitely going to be trying this. I will <laughs> definitely be uh, using that come Monday morning at my house or my office because uh, yeah, I, I'd never heard of that before. So that that's awesome. So when you mentioned, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back with the, the cultural yeah. fit. Is that just a is that a is that, that's just a terminology thing basically, or is it um, depending on the culture of the the office? You may you know, is it a communications thing in that respect or? A, just how they do business with the different uh, like SDLCs or agile or, you know? Yeah. When I say culture, I just mean the general, the makeup of the office. So um, are they very formal and do they require lots of paperwork and bureaucracy and that sort of thing? And do they need to hear things in a language that matches that and have a document that matches that? Or are they, if you deal with sort of more startup style companies, they're a lot more stroll over to the CEO's desk, say, Hey, can we do this? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, done. And they don't want a 200 page document detailing everything in minutia. They want a quick couple of pages that, that, that gives them the quick punchy. This is what you need to do. And to know that we've, we can back it up with a lot more data if we need to. Um, and also it's, it's partly about, language so financial institutions have their own language legal institutions have their own language healthcare etc so um it's kind of making it fit because if you go to i don't know um a startup that sells shoes say and start going to them and talking to them in the language that you would use when you're explaining something to a lawyer they're probably going to look at you like a little bit a little bit off whereas if you can put things in the language that they use in the office then they're much more likely to open the document in the office and discuss it and actually do something do something with it at the end of the day cool. so really it's that it's, it's making it fit with what what they need yeah what is b-s-i-m-m that was the uh now you're gonna make me open it up in a in a link and stuff it's like uh Something in mem memory management or something. Oh, you're killing me, dog. Oh, there goes my browser. <laughs> Great. Somebody Google BSSIM for me. <laughs> you're making us look like, oh, God, you're making us look like idiots here. All right. So the BSSIM building security and maturity model. I knew that because I posted the thing on there. It's just another way to uh, analyze you know, uh, real world information. It's another stride dread model where you're trying to, you know, like you're fond of saying, it, Mr. It talked a lot of, it talked a lot about threat modeling and I'm, I'm just wondering from Lee, is that something that you guys look at often? Oh, well, maturity models. Threat modeling. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, what was I thinking about here? Um, understanding your attacker, Right, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we do. Uh, the, I mean, these days, I mean, this is sorry, I'm fumbling my words because I'm thinking. There's um, there's some debate at the minute online about understanding your attacker. Insofar as uh, after the Sony situation, there's been a lot of debate about uh, attribution, which I would argue is where where they're going with this is the know your attacker the. You know, right. what does Chinese military institution want versus member of anonymous versus mm -hmm. your own government or, or whatever? And one of the strong sides of the argument is that you should stop attribution because at the end of the day, um, it doesn't make that much difference. There are there are levels like protecting against script kiddies and protecting against nation state. Those are admittedly two different levels you want to look at. But at the end of the day, um, an attacker is an attacker to a lot of people, whether they're in your own country, whether they're um, a, a competitor, whether they're foreign. It's still the same vulnerabilities and things they're going to use. It's only really, I think, when you get to nation state that you start to look um, differently at who the attacker is because, of course, now you're into the realms of... Uh, taps on your communications, uh, people doing black bag operations and, uh, and, you know, physically putting bits of hardware in your laptop and, mm. you know, that sort of thing, which is a whole other, other, it's another realm. League. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For most people, they're probably looking at two main types of attacker. The, the external 
coming in from the internet or maybe through some dial-up connection or something like that or the internal attacker and they probably blend largely into the same um there's there's different outcomes there's understanding your attacker in insofar as what they might do um you know the disgruntled exploit ex employee who wants to take down your network versus the uh, competitor who wants your customer list um versus the fraudster who wants all the customer credit cards you hold but at the end of the day these attacks now very rarely in my opinion go direct to uh the point at which they're gathering data like people don't have their customer credit card databases exposed to the internet they're probably going to pop something internet facing and then use lateral movement within the environment to work their way to the host they want to attack and if you look at attackers from that perspective you really want to be covering all your bases all the time and so trying to say i'm fending off credit card fraudsters is probably closing your eyes to several avenues of attack because they're probably not going direct to that database. And who knows? I mean, even if you do, and even if you're right, even if that's the only risk you have, say the only risk you're worried about at all in your environment is losing the credit cards from the, cre the database server they sit on. By focusing too much on that, you run the risk of missing something else. So, for example, you defend that thing to the hilt, and then someone goes and pops your backup server and then just downloads the backup of that database server. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it, it's possible. So I think, I think, sure, prioritize things. Everyone has their crown jewels they want to look after, especially companies that deal in intellectual property or hold a lot of financial data. But to put too much weight on the, the types of people... Um, and to single one out specifically uh, to defend against, I think, may miss things. That said, <laughs> going contrary to everything I just said, when you're doing, oh, no. when you're doing threat modeling, you need to consider all the different types. But that's not to say, uh, but it's not to the exclusion of all others. It's just to consider all the eventualities and all the different routes that people may take. But that's less about understanding um, the types of attackers in terms of competitor versus credit card fraudster it's to make sure that you've thought through the potential targets and the potentials avenue ever, uh, potential avenues of attacks to those targets yeah that's really good because uh, if somebody's uh, for example really focused on their data leaving the organization so they they have all these things in place on the network to detect data exfil yeah and then somebody just encrypts everything on the database and then demands a ransom, then you right. miss that. They didn't exfil any data. They just want to exfil money, right? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, so you're focus, you need to focus on um, all the potential different threats and yes. not just the one you think is the most dangerous to you at the time. Right, exactly. And, uh, and people are finding that out all the time. I think, um, you know, especially with the, the advent of people like uh, LulzSec and lizard squad and all that they're not they're not the traditional we're coming to get your credit cards people i think people have been caught offside a little by how these guys come in and just you know take down networks just for fun and you know i think that's maybe an angle that not everyone's explored um because they're they're too worried about about losing data and availability maybe wasn't as high up the up the go. ports list yeah yeah well that's uh so so what uh, I hate to use the term threat intelligence, but <laughs> but but threat intelligence, threat intelligence, threat modeling, threat modeling. So when you go into an organization, do you do you know that because of who they are, the the vertical they're in, what to expect in the way of threats to begin with, or do they just come out of left field and go, yeah, we know we're a banking, uh, you know, but but we're good against the Chinese threat. It, you know, what we're worried about is Carter's. I think. I think certain industries, I mean, there you go, there, there's a prime one, although that specific one hasn't come up. But banks, banks are the only people that are going to worry about people with ATM skinner, skimmers, for example. That doesn't feature in any other industry, and it's obviously something that is going to focus in theirs. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be something like that in different, um, in different industries. But 
yeah, you are never surprised by <laughs> by what a customer does or does not have in their environment at any one time. You can turn up and and be shocked every time. Uh, Give me an example. But, can, can you do oh, that without violating NDAs? Any kind of NDAs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. No, but, and there are certain things you can expect. I mean, um, there are, you know, banks, for example. It's not very often you go into a bank and you don't find a mainframe because mainframes are a bank thing. So yeah. there's certain things you can guarantee every time. Um, um, but that's not to say they don't have something to surprise you along yeah. the way. But but yeah, I mean you you can expect certain stuff, and there's there are things that are just everywhere. You know, um, you see Oracle or whatever that pack, that comes up everywhere because so many big organizations either have Oracle or SAP or something. There's only so many vendors that there can be, and um, and so these things always crop up. But yeah, in terms of knowing what's going to turn up in a in a um, in a particular industry vertical, um, maybe by virtue of the things they run. Uh, in terms of, let's think of a good example. In terms of hospitality, for example, if you look at a bar, a restaurant, a uh, hotel, coffee chain, they all have really similar point of sale systems. They've got that same Micros touchscreen thing that you put the orders in on. Uh, they've got one of a handful of devices for either swiping or chip and pinning your card, depending on what country you're in. And most of those devices and terminals use exactly the same backend infrastructure. So you go and turn up to a someone who has um, sort of food and beverage retail, you can guarantee pretty much what hardware they're going to have and that dictates pretty much what software they're going to have so straight away you've got a certain amount of intelligence on what the problem is going to be there um and then so there's a certain amount of road to run in um looking at their own config because these things are configurable and you know you might have it with or without ssl and that makes a difference you may have it with or without authentication and that makes a difference so you can look at that sort of thing but you then the differentiator between them then becomes the wider environment. So is that network internet facing? Does it just point back to head office? Are there files in between it and the center? Is there VPNs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And then you can and then that's when the different in this example hospitality companies start looking uh, different to each other and stop looking exactly the same. And now I've rambled so far, I forgot what the original question was. No, I think that was the. I think that was the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we want him to come back, so he he can say whatever he wants. Mr. Butcher, do you have any more questions? Because um, I've learned, I've learned more Too than much. I wanted to know about threat modeling, and it's it's a scary business, but it sounds exciting. It, it must be something where you know each engagement is going to be different and you know that uh, it's never going to be the same twice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's one of the things I'm, in, I'm enjoying on this side of the fence is the variety you get new Very environment nice. every time. Yeah. Very really nice. good. So, okay. So before, before we go, what kind of skills does one need to do threat modeling? Do you need to know a lot of code uh, audit capability? Do you need to know, you know, C coding and you, you need to read, be able to read code and, and script heavily and, and whatever. It's one of these things, I think, where you need to be fairly wide in knowledge. So as a prime example, like I can code to a degree, but I'm not a developer. I could not code things that perform like a developer makes things perform or does the maybe some of the complex functions that a developer can make it perform. However, I have the background in other areas such as security because developers, for example, are great at making things work how they're meant to work. Mm -hmm. They're not so great at necessarily thinking about how people will try and abuse them to make them work not how they were intended to work. Exactly. So things like the number of times you speak to a developer and they like <laughs> validating user input what <laughs> and and you know that's a key for a huge number of vulnerabilities and they don't perform uh you know that validation to quite the degree it should do so i think that in terms of skill it's things like knowing security and a bit of coding and some os's and some apps and you know being able to 
to piece a lot of things together because people will often say, hey, it's written in this language and it runs on Linux, but it talks to a Windows box over this protocol. And, you know, that's got to mean something to you for starters. Yeah. And, and secondly, it's um, I think it's kind of a mindset thing. Uh, so not just a a qualification, you know, not that you've got a bunch of MCPs and Cisco accreditations and whatever else. There's things like it's just the being able to think laterally about some of the stuff because um, things are not immediately obvious always, uh, especially when people are buried deep in an application until someone that understands it from like a security point viewpoint can explain to them that actually no, this this feature or whatever is a problem. So I think it's it's partly a mindset and partly, like I said, just a broad range of skills. Excellent. Yeah. Why would anybody put a single quote? It's it's a field for a, a monetary value. That's crazy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and to use an example that that comes up time and again um, is the oh, but we do validate user input. We've got this piece of JavaScript that runs in the web page oh, and God. makes sure they put a number in. It's like yes. you didn't know I can click JavaScript off, right? But why would <laughs> someone do that? Because they're trying to bypass this. Oh. And, uh, you know, it's just it's things like that, because I, I guess it's a mindset thing in that instance. But it's um, it's a combination of experience, mindset and, and broad knowledge base, I think. Yeah. OK. <laughs> I put negative one in this uh, and bought negative one of this item. How yeah. is that possible? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And that's happened. <laughs> oh God! Okay. They would. Oh, oh shock. <laughs> NDA. 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 Yeah. Uh, so, um, where can we uh, find you? Uh, you do talk. You do give. I mean, oh God. Um, <laughs> you do give talks and 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 attend security conventions. I was just wondering if you have a blog or something that we could go and, you know, pour poor knowledge from the fountain that is your head and uh, you know yeah. i started blogging again for the first time in a long time so blog.squarelemon.com is mine i will be appearing on the leviathan blog again soon hopefully um okay. in terms of talks i haven't got anything concrete lined up but i am doing some research with some people so hopefully we'll submit to some conferences this year uh -huh. um i always try and make sector and b-sides toronto because those are my local ones so um and I'm normally at Black Hat and DEF CON too. So okay. hopefully I'll be around. Hopefully I'll speak at something. <laughs> any any chance you'll make it down to DerbyCon this year? You and me and uh, Mr. Betcher could have us a, a, an adult beverage or, uh, you know. <laughs> it is one of the cons that I have never been to and really do want to go to, actually. So I've never been either. Yes. So Oh, you, you haven't? No, 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 Mr. Betcher took his wife last year. He couldn't take me. He took his freaking wife. <laughs> It's it's one of the ones I've heard good things about, so I would definitely be up for a meet up there. Yeah, for sure. Right on, right on. So yeah, um, you wanted to see the the horse races and stuff. Is that it, Tilly? <laughs> you disgust me. All right. So so you're on Twitter too. It's oh yeah, Synac PSE. <laughs> so okay, Synac so like the TCP handshake and Synapse mixed up. It's easier yeah. just to search for my name and find me. <laughs> Synac PSE or whatever. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was like Synap. I thought it was like Synapse or something. Like yeah. Yeah, I, I I mixed the two and just made it a confusing one that you can't pronounce audibly. So there we go. <laughs> yep. And of course, uh, you work for Leviathan Security, which is a local joint here in the Seattle area. Um, I've been down to their offices in the Soto area of Seattle. It's pretty awesome. Yes. Um, they are uh, they're at uh, www.leviathansecurity.com. They don't pay us to to say that um <laughs> obviously they're a good organization because they didn't hire me when i asked them to to, to join up so that that must show how what top flight organization they are because they didn't want me so um so <laughs> he's still laughing he's so tickled he can't say anything <laughs> all right well, um, I appreciate you you coming on, Lee. Uh, you know, you're always no welcome problem. to come on if you want to talk about anything. Thank you. And oh, I might uh, be back then. oh, good. I hope you will be back. <laughs> uh, so that was uh, breaking down security for uh, for February first, twenty fifteen. Episode five is in the hopper. And uh, everyone have a great week, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>